afternoon and welcome to Emmanuel's 5 p.m. Celtic Eucharist. Uh, if you are gathered online or here, we invite you to participate. Uh, we can sing with our masks on tonight and anyone who's speaking um, during the service as, um, by uh, diocesan protocol may take their mask off. So I'm glad that you're with us this evening. Spirit of the risen Christ, shine in our hearts and kindle in us the fire of love. The light, the light of Christ, Christ has come, come into the world. The light, the light of Christ, Christ has come into the world. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin, and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work, and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our reading today is Paul's letters to the Ephesians. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Our psalm tonight is Psalm 111 in your bulletin, and we'll say it on um, this side, uh, my side, uh, saying the odd verses, and that side responding with the even verses. Alleluia. 
I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in him. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He made his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has he shown, shown his people the power of his works and given them the lands of the nations. The, nation. the works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and in equity. He set redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who have the party saints have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I am them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors <coughs> ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Give your servant an understanding and discerning mind. In the name of Jesus, our living bread. Amen. Amen. So this is the second sermon of three on living bread, uh, living bread part two. And today I want to talk about particularly physical hunger. So to be human is to be hungry. Does Jesus' living bread satisfy human physical hunger, and if so, how? Now, the traditional explanation of the church of this passage from John, the sixth chapter of John, is that people need to eat food regularly to sustain the life of their bodies. In the same way, they need food regularly to sustain the life of their souls. In the Eucharist, communion, Jesus provides us with the real food for the soul, which is he himself. Therefore, we should receive it often and be very grateful for it. Well, that's from Monica Helwig's interpretation of traditional church teaching. But she suggests that this explanation is certainly not incorrect, but it's much too simple and easy of a formulation of how Jesus is living bread to us. Jesus' living bread is a multidimensional way of understanding hunger and the relief of hunger. The traditional explanation makes it sound as though we come to eat this bread as a passive and isolated individual for just our souls. But it's not just eating food that living bread is about, but sharing food as an interactive member of a community. 
Moreover, Jesus' living bread asks us to reflect on human hunger, physical hunger, over and over, to reflect, reflect on what kinds of hunger there are and what food for the soul, soul might possibly mean as well. If you think about the gospel passages and Jesus' movement in those three years, it's often about feeding real physical hunger and spiritual hunger, sometimes at the same time. But tonight I want to focus on physical hunger. <coughs> to be human is to be hungry. Now, those of us who've grown up in this part of the world, in an industrialized Western and technological society, we tend to think about our hunger, sometimes as we think about machines, maybe like cars. Like our car, we think of eating, and you've heard people say this, as refueling. We can satisfy our hunger quickly, and just as quickly forget that hunger is there at all. The problem with this way of thinking of hunger and eating is that one who's never been truly hungry is unlikely to have developed that deep compassion or concern for those who are constantly hungry and never satisfied. If we think of our hunger in terms of refueling our machine of a body, we sometimes forget that hunger is not only elemental and basic, but it is a painful and can be painful experience. People who are truly hungry are experiencing an urgent physical need. And this need must be satisfied before any other human qualities can be developed. Hunger can be brutalizing because the human need to survive through eating will overtake all other dimensions of a human life. It's hard to be thinking of moral questions and loving one another when you are very, almost deadly hungry. But once you have been hungry, deeply and truly hungry, you do understand that food and eating can never be an isolated, passive individual act. And most people who have a deep physical hunger, who have known that, also know what it is to rely on others for their very life. So, um, I don't know about Jack, but some, many of us do not satisfy our hunger on our own. Um, going out into the woods, foraging for nuts and berries and fruit and vegetables, <laughs> grains that have grown wild, catching game of fish that we kill, spear, pre prepare and cook over a fire kindled from sticks gathered in the woods. Now, some of us might do that on vacation, when camping, or on a hunting trip, and Jack might do that from time to time. But normally, we eat bread, think about this, sliced for us by one person, bought from another, transported by another, baked by yet another, with flour ground by still others, from grain grown elsewhere in fields cultivated with machinery made by further persons, from metal extracted from the earth by others. And whether we can eat at all, as we've determined in the pandemic when things are off the uh, grocery shelves, depends very heavily not only crops throughout the world and weather, but also on the relative values that international trade places on food and other commodities made by other people, those decisions, on raw materials and on manufactured goods, as well as services. When I read that in Monica Helwig's book, I just thought, wow, we are so interdependent. But we who are habitually well-fed are in danger of forgetting this interdependence and living as though we produced our own food somehow just because we earn a cash salary or receive a pension or dividends on an investment. But those who have been habitually deeply hungry are ever mindful of this interdependence. Now Jesus knows about this human need for hunger and our human nature. And in many cultures, food is always about two things, which you see in the Old and New Testament. Satisfying hunger, but also sharing of food and community. Now, maybe just Brian and I, but some of you might know the author and columnist Louis Brizard. 
He most wrote in a, um, in which, a column that was eventually syndicated for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in the 1970s and 80s. And he grew up in a little town in rural Georgia. Now, my, as you know, my sister-in-law is moving and she had a whole pile of books in her living room and I noticed his book was there. And so I said, well, I think I'm gonna take this to read because here was the title. If love were oil, I'd be a court low. And it was, <laughs> and it was about women. So I imagined that it was a book that would make me mad that I was gonna take it on. Um, but in this book, he does talk about his three wives and many girlfriends and his love life. But he mostly, and really at the heart, talks about his mother and grandmother and teachers and elder women in his life. So at his elementary school in rural Georgia, there was the usual lunch fair. This is the story he tells that just really captured me. Uh, the cafeteria there in the elementary school. And as Grusard describes it, he says this was the menu. On Monday, we had hot dogs and rice pudding for dessert. On Tuesday, we had meatloaf and rice pudding for dessert. <laughs> On Wednesday, there was some sort of mystery meat from said meatloaf with gravy on it and rice pudding for dessert. <laughs> on Thursday, they had chipped beef on toast and rice pudding for dessert. And on Fridays, they had fish sticks and rice pudding for dessert. <laughs> Grizard noted that on occasion, he would still, in his later years, ha have nightmares featuring huge mounds of rice pudding. <laughs> but, in the Moreland Elementary School cafeteria, there was one spectacular offering. That was Mrs. Murphy's Rolls. Mrs. Murphy was a tiny, sweet woman who was in charge of the school cafeteria. And at least three times a week, she would cook up a batch of homemade rolls. Grizard's classmates, now this is interesting, and I don't know if this happened in your school, were divided into two groups for lunch line. Those whose parents could afford the 20 cents a day for lunch money, known as the PAYS, P-A-Y-S. And those whose parents couldn't afford 20 cents for lunch, they were known as the FREES, F-R-E-E-S. And social PAYS, Grizard was one of those, felt somewhat superior to the FREES because the FREES were poor children who lived in shacks out in the country who rarely had shoes to wear, whose personal hygiene was suspect, and whose appetites never waned. You could tell where a free had sat at cafeteria after lunch. His or her plate would be completely empty. Even the rice pudding, Broussard said, would be gone. Broussard also lined up in the classroom at his school to go to lunch as pays and frees day after day. But then, one day, he noticed that something was different about the lunch line. He noticed that when Mrs. Murphy's rolls came out, that the, the pays and the freeze were equally excited. The pays usually got the freshest and hottest of Mrs. Murphy's rolls, as well as coldest glasses of milk nearby. They put the milk out beforehand in lines. But by the time the freeze walked through the line, only the dregs of the homemade rolls were left in the roll bin and their milk was warm. But that day that Grizzard noticed things had changed, here's what happened. Mrs. Murphy had noticed what was going on between the pays and the freeze. And she noticed that those who received the free lunches seemed to be much hungrier but also more appreciative of her daily offerings of the lunch line. So as time went by, although the pays still went first in the lunch line, Mrs. Murphy began to hold back some of the bigger, softer rolls for the freeze waiting outside in line. And she also instituted a policy whereby each student drew his or her own milk from the milk dispenser so that every student would have a glass of milk that was fresh and cold. One day, one of the frees came to school accompanied by his father, who was a sawmill hand at the nearby sawmill, who wanted to meet the roll lady who he heard so much about at home. 
And the man said to Mrs. Murphy, I got four other youngins at home, ma'am. If it would be all right, could my boy here bring his rolls home one day so they could have some? So I don't know if this was literary license, but Grizard said the man left that day with a huge sack filled with Mrs. Murphy's rolls. And Grizard thought that he noticed Mrs. Murphy's eyes were a bit red when she served his plate that day in the cafeteria lunch line. <clears throat> so whatever the embellishment of the story was, you get the idea. And I'm guessing that Mrs. Murphy knew what Jesus meant when he talked about living bread. I'm guessing she had been hungry, perhaps as a child. Or, and maybe Anne, was a deeply faithful Christian who learned, marked, read, and inwardly digested her scriptures. She and her roles were living bread for countless children who were in need and hungry at Moreland Elementary School. Now this story is interesting and compelling on many levels, but here's the really interesting thing and why it got my attention. My attention was uh, captured because I've heard a version of the story right here at Emmanuel, and I've heard it from Becky Millar, the founder and leader of 20 Years of Summer Lunchbox. Early on here at Emmanuel, I visited Becky at her home. And she talked about how she came to found Summer Lunchbox. She remembered a time when she was a young girl at school and there was a similar segregation of those who could afford lunch and those who couldn't. Those who could afford lunch had a special colored ticket and those who couldn't had a different color. That was seared in her heart and soul and her parents and they talked about it. And like Rosard, I think that image stuck with her always, and she vowed to change what she had seen as a young person. Becky Millar understands this dimension of Jesus' living bread, and that's why we have Summer Lunchbox to this day. For those of us that have never truly known hunger, the Christian tradition and practice of fasting is to remind us that hunger is painful those who hunger suffer. Churches that participate in programs to feed the community do this so that food may be shared by all. The hungry fed and the well fed have their eyes open to the gospel truth that we are all dependent on one another, every single one of us, no exception. Food should never divide. Food is to be shared, physical and spiritual food alike. And when it is shared with all, it becomes living bread. Amen. 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 Gracious God, we come to you in prayer for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, for those who minister in Christ's name, for our community, our nation, and our world, for the sick and all those in need, especially those we name before you now, for Isabel and Kay, for Melinda's upcoming surgery. For Ruth Goldblum, for the people in Kabul who are now faced with an assault of the Taliban and their flight. For the people of Haiti. For Marsha Ellen. For those who have died and those they have left, we look to you, O Lord. Put, put thy salve to our, our sight, put thy balm to our wounds, put, put thy linen robe to our skin, O healing hand, O Son of God of salvation. 
Remaining standing, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. For the ways we have sinned against you, O God, for the ways we have hurt those around us, for the ways we have grieved the spirit who is in us, for the good things we have failed to do, forgive us, Lord, forgive us. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, Strengthen your body, mind, and spirit, and keep you close to the heart of God. Amen. So bowing to one another, peace be in your thinking, peace be in your hearts, peace with creation, peace with one another. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. So if you haven't been to the service before, uh, we generally, I, I'll put my mask back on after I do the um, communion prayer here, uh, prayer of consecration, and then we'll come into the middle and uh, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll give you the bread, the living bread, and uh, so just be careful coming down the steps. A couple of things, um, uh, Jack was asking about Heritage Days. Uh, there's a sign up there. Uh, we're hoping to have our Josephine County concert during Heritage Days, which is the Saturday night, a really great Celtic bluegrass group from Maine. So please, uh, there's another sign up sheet on, on the table if you would like to reserve tickets. We're giving uh, Emanuel folks a chance to reserve tickets about a week to 10 days before they go on general public sale. And we'll ask that you pay before September 1st or the tickets will get released. But we're, it's gonna, um, we're hoping with uh, everything that's going on health-wise that we'll be able to have the concert. We hope if we need to move out of the parish hall that we'll have everyone outside if it's a nice evening with the band on the parish hall steps there. So do sign up. Also, um, one thing that's not on that board is Miss Edie is looking to do planters. We're going to kind of center all our activity outside Hoy House, right in between that and Barkdall House on that parking lot. And so we're putting a bunch of planters and tables and umbrellas out there so people can have the strawberry shortcake that'll, that Terry is heading up that'll be sold right next to the garage. So uh, if you'd like to buy plants for a planter, if you're not going to be here Heritage Days or that might be a way you'd like to contribute, let me know or Miss Edie know. She'll provide the planter and the soil, and the, you, there's some examples of it right over in the parking lot, right by the Barkdall House garage. Uh, a couple of other things. Yoga's on hiatus until the fall, later in the fall, as we get through this little surge here of COVID. Uh, and a couple of other pastoral notes. Isabel Edmondson, who I spoke about in the sermon uh, she is uh, I went to be the whole family came in town this week and we went to pray and help her make her way home to God uh, she is uh, please pray for her and Dolores and Carl and Dolores's brother Jim and Dolores's two daughters um, Amy and um, let's see it's Amy and Leslie and Amy lives with Isabella has lived with her for several years decades now and so I'm, it's a very hard time for them but it's a wonderful thing to have your family all around so please pray for nasal rods and isabel k dewey is making uh strides uh, leaps and bounds from her fall and surgery at 97. she's at formerly lion's manor i heard it's called hearthstone now in room 208c and she cannot have visitors because there's been a covid case with one of the staff but she would love to get cards. So we'll put the card address in the Nova, but we'll also, uh, Karen can give it to you if you call the office. Um, so she would love to hear from people. She's doing really well. And as I said, uh, Melinda Kelleher, my sister-in-law is having elbow surgery this week. So keep her in prayer as she gets ready for that. And uh, are there other announcements? So this service will continue with five o'clock 
all the way through this year, except for Heritage Days Sunday, where there'll just be one service at nine. We'll go to nine o'clock services starting Heritage Days, which is September 12th, Sunday, September 12th, and always have after that Sunday, nine and five for the rest of the year, except for Christmas, probably, Christmas Eve. So let me set the table and we'll have communion. And as they say in Africa, always give thanks for the rain. Mm -hmm. We're thankful mm -hmm. for that. Please stand. All things come from you, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. Now let us lay aside all the cares of this life that we, like the angels, may offer our worship, joining with them in singing to the thrice holy and life-giving Trinity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We bless you, High King of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread and wine to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. They will become our spiritual food and drink. Let us be God forever. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks for all the Lord has done. God leads us through the years. High King of the universe, you have brought forth the earth. You breathe wisdom into all your creatures till we reflect your threefold friendship. In our pain and sorrow, we cry out to you, tender lamb perfect sacrifice for our sins. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may these gifts of bread and wine be for us Christ's body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed took bread, gave you thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. After supper, he took the cup, gave you thanks and said to them, Drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Alas, we have seen the Son of the living God stretched out on a cross. The cross is like the parting of the day from night. Yet through it all, all may now proclaim, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Risen Christ, we welcome you. You are the flowering bough of creation. From you cascades music like a million stars, truth to cleanse a myriad of souls. From you flee demons, evil, and all ill will. Around you rejoice the angels of light. Father, send us the tender spirit of the Lamb. Feed us with the bread of heaven. May we be filled to the fullest with your holiness. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
is entwined with earth, we have taken the divine life into ourselves, and so now each may say, I rise up clothed in the strength of Christ. I shall not be imprisoned. I shall not be harmed. I shall not be downtrodden. I shall not be left alone. I shall not be tainted. I shall not be overwhelmed. I go clothed in Christ's white garments. I go free to weave Christ's patterns. I go love to serve Christ's sweet ones. Let us pray for Christ's presence with those in need this night. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. The shielding of God be with you, the love of God to enfold you, the peace of God to still you, the Spirit of God to fill you, the saints of God to inspire you, this hour, this night, forever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and shine out through you this night and always. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.